He was a diminutive man, shorter than others, with a bald head and a full beard that was brownish-red in color. His dark eyes appeared to be always amazed or surprised, and his thick, bushy eyebrows arched over them. Henri Landru did not have the outward appearance of a man who could be trusted with the live savings of more than three hundred women. Vulnerable women, however, discovered something unique and appealing about this bourgeois-used furniture salesman and mechanic. Ten of them would lose their lives as a result of their readiness to trust the lies Landrieu told them, which would cost them more than just their pitiful financial situation. Landrieu's early years were as unremarkable as he himself. He was born in 1869, in the heart of France's Third Republic, to parents of low means. His father worked as a firefighter in the furnaces of the Vulcane Ironworks in Paris, while his mother was a stay-at-home mom. Henri a young man who went to Catholic school and was accepted as a subdeacon in the St. Louis N. Leal religious order, was regarded as a clever young man. Like many boys of his time, his education came to an end around his seventeenth year after enrolling in engineering classes at the esteemed School of Mechanical Engineering. Landru, who joined the military at age eighteen and rose through the ranks, was discharged four years later with the rank of sergeant. By the time he was a teenager, Landru had undoubtedly come to terms with the fact that he was smarter than most people and sexy. He wooed Mademoiselle Remy, his cousin, in 1891, and she became pregnant and gave birth to his daughter. After two years, Landru wed Madame Remy, while he served as the regiment's quartermaster at St. Quentin. Landru quit the military after their marriage and started working as a clerk at a company. The fact that his boss was dishonest and stole the cash Landru had provided him with as a bond, however, left a lasting effect on Henri. Landru supposedly made a pledge to live a life of crime in order to exact revenge on fate after this strike. Despite being a deacon and choir member in his church, Landru also started a swindling operation in addition to his lawful jobs as a furniture dealer and garage owner. His primary targets were typically the middle-aged widows he met through the furniture industry. These women would come to him to sell their goods because they were accustomed to following their husband's orders and were worried about living long, lonely, impoverished lives. In addition to stealing their belongings and preying on their worries, Landru would charm his victims and persuade them to let him invest their small pensions, which he would then swiftly take. The con was successful for a while, up until 1900, when Landru made his first appearance as a criminal in a French tribunal. After attempting to use a false identity to withdraw money from the Comtois Discount, he was given a two-year prison sentence for fraud. After being detained, Landru allegedly made a fake suicide attempt. He kept Madame as his wife. They had four kids together with Remy. Landru served as much as three years at a time in prison during the course of the following ten years, going in and out seven times, apparently the Third Republic had no three strikes rules. He appears to have come up with a plan that would ultimately lead to his execution sometime in or around 1908. In that same year, Landru, who was already spending time in a jail in Paris for fraud, was transferred to Lille to face trial for a second crime. He had published a marriage advertisement in a newspaper, presenting himself as a prosperous widower looking for the company of a widow in a comparable situation. Landru persuaded a forty-year-old widow to give him a fifteen-thousand-franc dowry in exchange for some false deeds. Madame! Isor was left penniless and turned to the legal system for compensation. By the time the gendarmerie caught up with Landru, the dowry was gone, so she would have to make do with the knowledge that he would spend a further three years. He was presumably freed just before World War I with the intention of re-enlisting in the French army. Due to his lawlessness, he had already forced his father to commit suicide and left his family bankrupt and ashamed. Mother Landru had passed away in 1910. 
He was aware that he had been sentenced to life in prison in New Caledonia after being found guilty in absentia of a number of other felonies as he floated throughout the countryside. A special killer. As soon as the war began, Landru, who was still wed to Remy but was no longer in his life, started the con games that ultimately brought him to ruin. Perhaps Landru's transformation into a murderer was brought on by the war and its as yet unknown toll of fatalities, perhaps it was the years he spent in doubtlessly brutal French prisons, perhaps it was something else entirely. The Earl of Birkenhead, a distinguished Oxford don and the author of famous trials of history, refutes the idea that Landru's murders of his female suitors were motivated by bloodlust. In the wonderful sequel to Famous Trials from 1929, he states, there seems to be no evidence of that. It is natural that some of the ladies would be difficult to shake off, and others would have showed little desire to hand over their property. A guy who starts on this kind of expedition must shake himself free of entanglement. We must therefore postulate that he was callous and inhuman, an assumption that offers no difficulty, seeing as how his very mode of life was impossible for any other kind of man. Birkenhead concludes that the obvious way to overcome their attachment was to destroy them, and to do so was only too easy. The entry in Wilson's Encyclopedia of Murder recounts the savoir faire that made Landru attractive to his victims. His sense of humor and strong will undoubtedly came out during his detention, interrogation, and at his trial. Renowned criminologist Colin Wilson calls Landru a callous ruffian who deserved to be guillotined. If ever a serial killer resembled a mythic figure, it was Henri Landru as Bluebeard. Perrault's fairy tale about the blue-bearded monster that kills his wives but is done in by a young woman's curiosity is a well-recounted story. Not only does it exist in French literature, but in African, Spanish, and Chinese legend as well. Few serial killers are ever struck by remorse or guilt for their actions, except to say that they are sorry to have been captured, so it is clear that Landru was without conscience. His victims, both the living and the dead, were among the more vulnerable members of society, as a result, it is possible to develop a simple profile of this modern bluebeard. His physical appearance was more humorous than attractive, therefore he must have been a smooth, fast talker. His sexual appetite was said to be insatiable. He was undoubtedly a passionate man, able to sweep lonely ladies off their feet. The same time that Landru was taking advantage of women, he was also cheating tired, newly discharged troops of their pensions. Landru was intelligent and silver-tongued, not only with the ladies but also with his fellow soldiers and other men. Although he had a mistress and was cheating on both her and his wife, Landru was not a straightforward psychopath like other serial killers, he had a sense of right and wrong, but did not apply the same standards to himself. He also displayed some remorse over some of his actions, not his murders, expressing embarrassment in court that his wife, the patiently waiting wife, had been cheated on by him. Henri Landru is difficult to categorize because he does not truly fall into any one type of criminal profile, at best, he can be referred to as a multiple murderer rather than a serial or spree killer. He cannot really be considered a serial killer, since a serial killer is currently defined as a person who kills three or more victims, in different places, in either an organized or disorganized manner, with some sort of cooling-off period between the killings. Typically, the killings are the culmination of a build-up of lust or anger, and the murderer finds a sense of release after the slaying. Spree murderers, in contrast, are those who commit multiple murders over a short period of time in a variety of locations, in a disorganized manner, and frequently without having any control over the victim choice or the time of the murder. Henri Landru was in control of his victim choice and the time of the murder. Spree murderers are typically wanted for at least their first offense, often before that, and law enforcement agencies frequently know their identity before arrest. Landru's method of killing is unknown, but evidence at his villa suggests that the slayings were most likely clean, and that the victims were most likely not defiled in any way. It is possible that Landru killed during a sex act, but there is no evidence that suggests this was the case. He is distinct among other murderers because anger, retaliation, or sexual desire were not his primary motivations. As proof of death is frequently required in insurance or inheritance scams, 
few killers want to wait a decade or so to collect their ill-gotten reward, most killers for financial gain do not destroy the evidence of their victims' deaths, but Landrieu obviously took great pains to cover up his crimes. He sought to avoid detection and make it appear as though his victims were still alive. Henri Landrieu combined the worst traits of the worst kind of criminal, in effect, he invented a new classification of multiple killer, he was the male equivalent of a black widow spider, one that takes what it needs and then murders its mate without remorse. Blackbeard's Wives In 1914, the Parisian newspapers carried the following ad, widower with two children, aged 43, with comfortable income, serious and moving in good society, desires to meet widow with a view to matrimony. Landru, who placed the ad, had no trouble meeting ladies. For a French widow, faced with a life of loneliness and poverty in the depressed economy of wartime France, such an advertisement must have seemed as heaven-sent. The first woman to meet this 20th-century bluebeard was Madame Cutchet, a 39-year-old mother of a 16-year-old son, André, who worked in a lingerie shop in Paris and was barely scraping by when she met Landru, who introduced himself as Monsieur Diard and said he was an engineer. After Cutchet and Diard had a falling out, Cutchet begged her family and brother-in-law to go with her to Diard's villa near Chantilly, in the hope of settling their differences. Landru was not in when they arrived, but the family apparently felt enough at home to search the villa. She chose to ignore her family's advice to dump the imposter and instead furnished a villa at Venouet, outside of Paris and became estranged from her family. Diard, Cutchet, and her son moved to the villa. Her brother-in-law discovered a chest filled with many letters from other women, and informed Cutchet that her lover was a fraud. Immediately after the three moved into Venoué, Landru opened a bank account with 5,000 francs, which he claimed was part of his father's inheritance, though it is highly likely that the money came from Cutchet. Shortly after Cutchet's disappearance, Landru's wife was given Cutchet's watch as a present. Cutchet and André were last seen alive in January 1915. The widow of a hotelier from Argentina named Madame Le Bourdeline was his next victim. She had informed acquaintances that she was going to marry a charming Brazilian engineer, but due to bureaucratic obstacles, they chose to forego the wedding and live together instead. Le Bourdeline was last seen in July 1915, when she had arrived at the villa with her two dogs. After that, a man that her old neighbours identified as Landru came back and grabbed her stuff, transferring some to his villa and the remainder to a garage in Neuilly. Also in 1915, a Madame Horn visited Venoué and vanished, as did Madame Guillain, a 51-year-old widow whose full name was Marie-Angelique Desiree Pelletier. Only history knows whether there were others between the killings of Horn and 19-year-old André Babely, a servant girl who vanished in March 1917 while travelling to see her mother. Babely's murder is also a mystery, she was as poor as a church mouse and had nothing to give Landru but her charms. Did she, like Fatima in The Legend of Bluebeard, stumble on Landru's secret, or was she simply killed because he could not get? After Babely vanished, Landru fled Venoué for a new home in Gambais and immediately had a large cast iron oven erected. He stayed under the radar for over two years, but soon reverted to his deadly ways. Landru was supposedly busy with other frauds like his detached army scam and a petrol fraud. She travelled with him to Gambais, without her son, who went to live with his aunt, and Buisson was last seen in April 1917. Landru courted affluent widow Madame Buisson for about a year before he was able to create an estrangement from her family. After Madame Louise Lepoldini Jaume, his third victim in Gambais, vanished in September 1917. Landru's new neighbours in Gambais saw black, foul smoke pouring from his property. Finally, Marie Therese Marchadia, an entertainer known among the non commissioned officers of the French army as La Belle Mathise and who had retired to relative anonymity in Paris, was visited by Landru who wanted to buy her furniture. A friendship blossomed and she accompanied the murderer to Gambais in late 1918 and then disappeared. Annette Pascal, 38, followed Joan by disappearing in the spring of 1918. It would take two worried families to finally bring Bluebeard to justice, after at least ten women, one boy, and two dogs had vanished after meeting Landru, 
but no police had ever suspected him of any wrongdoing. The detention of Landru and the investigation. Although Landru had gone to tremendous lengths to keep his victims apart from their families, after they had perished, he still went to considerable lengths to reassure the families that their loved ones were still alive and well. Landru forged letters from Buisson to her dressmaker and to the concierge of her Paris apartment, he sent postcards to two of Guillaume's friends claiming that Guillaume was unable to write herself, he pretended to be the divorce lawyer for Madame Jaume and closed out her bank accounts. Her sister remembered that Madame Buisson had whispered her intention of running away to Gambais with a Monsieur Guillet, but the family was unable to locate her. Two years after Buisson met Landru, her son, who was staying with her sister, passed away. The mayor of Gambais responded that he was unaware of either Buisson or Guillet, but suggested that she contact the family of a Madame Colomb who was also missing in Gambais and had disappeared under similar circumstances. Colomb had left after meeting Landru in early 1917, and no one had noticed. When the police went to Villa Hermitage, as Landru's estate was known, they could not find Fremier, Dupont, Diard, the name given to Colomb's family, or Landru. The villa was vacant but recently lived in, and the mayor told the family of Buisson that the tenant in question was not Monsieur Fremier, the fiancé of Buisson, but M. Dupont. Buisson's sister Mademoiselle Lacoste was not deterred, she had seen Fremier and started searching the streets of Paris near Fremier's former home. In 1919, her search paid off when she saw Landru emerge from a dry goods store and followed him, only to lose him in the crowd. The police were called and Landru was detained when she went back to the shop and discovered that the man's name was Guillet, not Fremier, and that he resided in the Rue de Rochechouart with his mistress. There was no proof that Landru had killed anyone, and the stubborn Bluebeard was hesitant to cooperate with authorities, so the gendarmerie questioned what charge could be brought against him. Murder was obviously suspected, but where was the body? All the police had was a cryptic memorandum book where Landru had meticulously recorded his income and expenses. They returned to Gambais where a thorough search was conducted. The gardens were excavated looking for bones, but the only remains police found were those of a pair of dogs. They searched his old villa at Venue and came up equally empty. A Cutchet, G. Cutchet, Brazil, Crozatia, Havre was an entry on one page that caught the attention of authorities among the voluminous notes. C.T. Buisson, André Babely, Louis, Sick, Jaume, A. Pascal, and Michael Thr. They assumed this was a list of victims but again, they had no bodies. Buisson and Colomb were gone and the authorities quickly discovered that the whereabouts of the Cutchets were also under investigation. For two years, authorities looked into the disappearances of his victims, but Landru never admitted anything, believing mistakenly that he could not be found guilty of murder without a body, such a conviction is possible under French law. Interestingly, Landru had recorded the purchase of one-way tickets from Paris to Gambais for each of his victims, while marking round-trip tickets for himself. Slowly, they learnt that each of the ladies in the ledger had met Landru through his marriage advertisements and had disappeared. Authorities repeatedly tried to connect Landru to purchases of acids and other chemicals, but to no avail. Finally, neighbours at Gambais informed authorities of the foul fumes that frequently emanated from the kitchen. The stove that Landru had installed soon after he arrived in Gambais was examined, and horrifying evidence of murder was discovered. Landru had disposed of his victims by burning their remains, but what had happened to M. Colomb and M. Buisson, as well as the nine others, was obvious. In the ashes police found small bones, undoubtedly human, as well as burned, but still recognizable fasteners of the kind worn on the clothes of French women. Landru was charged with eleven charges of murder and put on trial two years after his capture. The Landru Trial Consider the circumstances of the trial, Landru was detained in Paris in April 1919 with his mistress, 27-year-old Fernand Segret, whom he had met on an autobus in the city, France was still recovering from the bloodiest war in history, and the peace negotiations at Versailles were not going well for them. There is little doubt that Landru's trial captivated his countrymen. A case that promised sex, gossip, 
and a grisly murder was amusingly played up by the papers as a respite from the dull daily existence of post-war France as shortages and economic hardship abounded. Additionally, remember that there was no such thing as a serial killer in 1919, even though multiple murder was not unheard of in Europe, unlike now, when the idea of a serial killer is as common as a pickpocket was in the 19th century. The idea that a Frenchman, a Parisian no less, could be capable of such atrocities had a significant impact on the society. The murders carried out by Jack the Ripper across the English Channel were just 40 years earlier and a human monster who could kill so many without remorse was still an aberration to the French and English alike. The trial for Landru started in November 1921 and lasted about a month. Not only does the chief judge of the three-judge panel act as an interrogator, but the French also permit questioning of the accused for purposes of investigation in front of the jury during the trial. The French system of justice was established in 1848, and while it does not, as is commonly believed, assume the guilt of the accused until innocence is proven, it is heavily weighted against the person on trial. The French judicial system also permits the victim's family to file a claim for damages during the trial, and the victim's attorney is permitted to cross-examine the defendant and make their case in front of the jury. Landru's defense was essentially to stonewall the court, he would repeatedly refuse to answer questions and would respond that it was none of other people's business what he knew about their disappearances, clinging to his incorrect conviction that he could not be convicted without evidence of a body. He also thought that his innocence was guaranteed because he had been found to be sane enough to face trial. He explained to the media that by admitting I was sane, they were proving my innocence. The media followed the trial with a level of fervor that was unheard of at the time. He refused to alter his story while being grilled by the court for days. Landru only shrugged his shoulders and rejected everything or refused to discuss it, much to the annoyance of the onlookers, every new piece of evidence that came to light. How do you feel about Madame Guillaume? He was questioned in public court. Landru responded to the frustrated magistrate, I am a gallant man and will say nothing. I cannot think of disclosing the nature of my relations with Madame Guillaume without the lady's permission. Landru's health deteriorated during the trial, and he started making statements of fact in response to inquiries, but the prosecution easily disproved his claims. Lord Birkenhead called Landru's tactic a tactical error, noting that where explanations are obviously needed, the failure to afford these explanations will tend to confirm the inference. The jurors was plainly irritated by Landru's impudence in court, his evasions and eagerness to respond with sarcasm only served to demonstrate that he was the kind of man who would deceive ladies similar to his victims. After over 25 days of testimony, the jury reached the conclusion that Landru had murdered the 11 women in only two hours, with the death penalty as the result. Meet Madame Guillotine and Bluebeard. Unlike American justice, where a prisoner is well aware of his or her execution date, the French system does not inform the condemned until very close to the execution. As a result, it only took Landru two months from the time of his conviction before receiving word that his execution was imminent. Although it is usually believed to be a compassionate means of execution, the guillotine raises certain concerns regarding how soon a victim passes away after having their head severed. In the 1960s, two physicians declared that death is not instantaneous. Every vital element survives decapitation, it is a savage vivisection followed by premature burial. Piedlever and Fournier continue by talking about how the brain can continue to produce oxygen for up to six minutes after being severed from its head. Eyewitness stories raise more concerns about how quickly death set in following the beheading. According to Colin Wilson, did it, those who saw the grimacing heads in the basket wondered, kill instantly. The answer to this subject was hotly contested in the 1790s since witnesses said that Charlotte Corday's head not only reddened but also showed most unequivocal signs of indignation when it was smacked by the assistant executioner. An even more explicit story of a French doctor's experimentation with a criminal's head was published in 1905. The head dropped on the severed surface of the neck, I was not even need to touch it to raise it straight, chance served me well for the observation which I sought to make. 
the man who had been guillotine's eyelids and lips were in irregular rhythmic contraction for around five or six seconds. This is what I was able to observe right away. All persons who found themselves in my situation and observed what happens after the neck is severed made note of this phenomenon. I waited for a few seconds, during which the spasmodic movement stopped, the face relaxed, and the eyelids partially closed, revealing only the conjunctivas white. At that point, I yelled in a loud, stern voice, languil. I observed the eyelids slowly raise up, without any spasmodic contractions, I caution you to pay attention to this peculiarity, but rather with an even movement, fairly distinct and typical, like what occurs in daily life when people are aroused or distracted from their thoughts. The pupils in Langwell's eyes then narrowed and they very clearly focused on mine. The eyes that were staring at me were obviously alive, unlike the vague, expressionless gaze that one may see on the face of a dying person to whom one speaks on any given day. After a few seconds, the eyelids slowly and evenly closed once more, and the head returned to its previous appearance. At that point, I yelled again, and this time, without any spasm, the eyelids gently rose, and unmistakably alive eyes fastened on mine with probably even greater acuity than before. The eyelids continued to close, albeit less completely this time. I tried to mimic the effect of a third call, there was one more movement, and the eyes developed the glazed appearance that the dead have. The entire thing had lasted twenty-five to thirty seconds, the witness said, and I have just described to you with rigorous exactness what I was able to observe. Regardless, Landrieu was executed by the guillotine in February 1922. Landrieu bid his attorneys farewell and gave them some artwork he had created in Incarcerated. His attorneys would have discovered a written confession from Landrieu acknowledging his murders and the method by which he disposed of the bodies if they had examined inside the frame, but this was not found until almost five decades later. He declined to attend a mass and turned down his jailer's offer of the customary brandy glass. Landrieu furiously declined to respond, claiming that the question itself was offensive. Landrieu stood in front of the guillotine, which, ever since the French Revolution a little more than a century earlier, had been the country's favoured method of death. He knelt down, and in a flash, the blade was down, killing one of history's most callous mass murderers without ever showing remorse.